Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. Ecosystem function describes how an ecosystem operates as a structure involving the ecological processes under the influence of the constraints of the physical environment. Biological diversity or biodiversity builds on this stable and functioning platform with the number of species in each habitat. Much of this diversity is found in the world's tropical areas, particularly in the forested regions. A habitat in equilibrium has a balance between the number of species present and its resources. Diversity is affected by resources, productivity, and climate. The more pristine and extensive a diverse habitat, the better chance it has to survive a change or threat, either natural or human, because that change can be balanced by the adjustment elsewhere in the community. Damaged or limited habitats may be destroyed by breaking the food chain with removal of a single species. Thus, biological diversity helps prevent extinction of species and help preserve the balance of nature. Biodiversity assessment must be made at spatial and temporal scales. We strive to ensure that habitat is not converted or degraded. In cases of conversion or degradation, the manager needs to ensure that appropriate mitigation measures are understood and implemented. This continues the discussion and recognition of how all biotic actors in this production have value to the design. We see the results of synergy, even when we think it comes from a single performance. Whenever we talk about biodiversity through a humanitarian lens, we are really expressing our personal views of social well-being. Social well-being concepts are found when basic human needs are met, and people coexist peacefully. This end state is characterized by equal access and delivery of basic services like water, food, shelter, and health services. Social well-being is a sense of involvement with other people and within our communities. Many researchers believe that well-being is not just about being happy or content, but also about being actively engaged with life, other people, and the environment we live in and interact with. There is so much we do not know about the consequences of the loss of biodiversity. Some will argue that species loss has caused well, no major problems thus far. But the longer we heedlessly destroy habitat and threaten the viability of life forms, the greater our risk of serious ecological collapse. We are eating away at life's insurance policy and meddling with the natural balance of the ecosphere. Early in the study of natural resource ecology, I told everyone that wildlife has needs provided by the ecosystems where they live. This is an expression of balance to each species. However, I then point out that this relationship is bidirectional, in that the environment has needs delivered by the species it hosts. Equilibrium can be sustained only when the perpetual flow of energy is sustained within the system. Matter and energy are recycled within the environmental systems. Biologist and naturalist Edward Wilson wrote, quote, The Creation, An Appeal to Save Life on Earth, end quote, where he pinned, quote, The decline of Earth's biodiversity is an unintended consequence of multiple factors that have been enhanced by human activity. They can be summarized by the acronym HIPPO, with the order of the letters corresponding to their rank in destructiveness, end quote. He wrote that H is for habitat loss, including that caused by human-induced climate change. I is for invasive species, harmful aliens including predators, diseases, and competitors that displace native species. P is for pollution. The other P is for population, human overpopulation to be exact a root cause of the other four factors. And O is for overharvesting, which is overuse from hunting, fishing, and gathering. How to reduce loss. How about we start with awareness? Did you even know this tortoise is at risk to habitat loss? Now that you know, what will you do? That is at least a start. But next, you can begin investigations to what has really happened in the time before your awakening. What is happening now? 
Are you part of discussions to decide what happens next? Valuing biodiversity distracts from the purpose of this effort. When we place a value on something, we need to start by asking what type of value is used. Is it monetary value, social value, or maybe the value as articulated by somebody or something else? We do not have capacity to put values uniformly on non-monetary assets which are not traded in competitive markets with many buyers and many sellers. It is not a trading floor filled with willing buyers and willing sellers. We consider balance in ecosystems with biotic and abiotic components, where matter and energy are exchanged and recirculated. The only feasible actions to be taken by people is to keep all options open and available to the synergy of live processes. When we do things right, we make neither decisions to expatriate any species artificially, nor to preserve precariously any others. Allow nature to strike the balance. This is the most valuable competitive market. This series of observations is not just a happenstance occurrence. We are part of the natural balance, born here and living our life cycles on site. We can do things to mitigate hazard profiles for other organisms created through our uses. Corridors of connectivity link communities where we cut them apart. We are thinking metapopulations with corridors between habitable environments. Terrestrial mammal populations are linked to lessen our interstate highway connections. Other times, it is our management of landscapes through the recognition of how terrestrial animals and birds connect their cycles of their annual life needs. It recognizes how winter cover needs transition to spring calving grounds, then to summer feeding sites, each seasonal habitat needing a transitionary patch to traverse. These are metapopulations with corridors between habitable environments. All of these are necessary biodiversity patches. Oftentimes, managers think in static terms, trying to create and maintain a status quo. Living life functions are never static. That is the realm of abiotic elements. And even then, the basalt rock fortress will show signs of decomposition. Uh, think of lichens and primary succession. Give it enough time and you will see change happening. The intermediate disturbance hypothesis urges human land managers to implement a management regime where change is implemented such that the continuity of life cycles is perpetual, sustainable, and staggered in time. We strive to attain changes within the realm of the natural range of variability. Again, think in terms of the time applicable to nature, not the time of human reactions. I keep dragging you back to metapopulations. We attempt to manage islands of land within the continental and global foundations of life. Schools of thought are applied to these concepts. Consider these ideas from a species approach and from the ecosystem side of the ledger. Both are viable, and the astute manager will do both simultaneously. From the species approach, we concentrate on prevention of species extinction. Do not allow a species to expatriate. We implement National Environmental Protection Act compliance to ensure the unique plants and animals are not evacuated from the environment, especially if its extinction is a result of human interventions. The approach from ecosystem enhancement is to recognize unique and widespread habitats as bastions of land where the variety of species, communities, and populations will exist. The preservation approach is to maintain these collections to the benefit of the species living there, in mass, because it is only within this larger collection that balance will be reached. Each ecosystem is the result of filters delivering species to the current status. This is how shade-tolerant tree species became established under the canopy of older filter trees. Those shade-tolerant trees will continue to filter for the shrubs, mosses, and mushrooms. At each progression, species richness grows for plants, animals, and mycorrhiza. On the left side is species from rich Locksaw River Valley in Idaho, USA. On the right, Pori in West Coast Finland. Both are conifer forests, and both show high levels of biodiversity. But what about the filters for each species that limit community membership or make opportunities for each? They are similar in structure and plant forms, 
but different in specific species membership credentials. Huh. Both represent a high degree of species diversity. I have kept our attention on focused ecosystems, existing within specific environments where species pools are controlled by the specifics of the local environment. Combinations of these landscapes across mesoclimates and regions lead to speciation and dispersal. It was the speciation of roadrunners becoming the greater roadrunner and the lesser roadrunner. It is the spread of the white-tailed deer branching out to fill unique high-elevation habitat niches in the Rocky Mountains to create habitat for mule deer, now not able to cross-breed to make viable offspring. This is speciation in the presence of changing biotic and abiotic forces. We witness these changes on a global scale where the number of plant species is greater the closer you get to the equatorial zones. Many researchers have hypothesized that climatic factors somehow cause species to originate more quickly in tropical regions. Although there is ample debate on this topic, considering why more species are found at the equator, the answer will generally pivot on those areas having more growing time available. Remember I told you that biological productivity action is all about the water and its temperature at the time of delivery. This is the actionable power as you approach the warmer ecozones. More time of growing, warmer temperatures and humidity. Equatorial efficiency shines on the productivity of ecosystem diversity. We talk about the realm of species protection and the need for ecosystem maintenance. But recall I told you to strive to keep all options open. Do not eliminate the choices you will make. Sometimes our predecessors did eliminate the inconsequential species that were a nuisance to our way of life. Is that okay? <laughs> does, it, does it even matter now? I take you to the Olympic Mountains. Western Washington to Mount Anderson, and down the Quinault River. This river system pours into Lake Quinault, then farther downstream to the Pacific Ocean as it passes through the territorial homelands of the Quinault Indian Nation. Here we stand near Amanda Park, overlooking Lake Quinault. This beautiful lake is a temporal holding site for the blueback salmon, a sockeye salmon that on its return to natal spawning lands will hold up for months to a year as it prepares its final life cycle approach. Salmon can migrate out to sea to feed for several years before returning to spawn in the same stream, sometimes even the same stream section in which they were born. Speciation has filtered this Ancorhinus nerca salmon to be uniquely suited to the ecosystem of the Quinault River. This is what the species anticipates from the environment. Blueback salmon evolved to this specifically defined ecosystem. Through time, temperate rainforests have evolved supporting western red cedar, Engelmann spruce, Douglas fir, western hemlock, and a plethora of understory species. This combination supported ungulate mammals in the ecosystem with gray wolves, coyote, cougar, black bears, and fisher filling the carnivore niche. Rivers were abundant with riparian vegetation constraining stream sides with shading and flow restricting sticks in the creeks. Then, late in the 19th century, logging found the Olympic Mountains, as lumber was desired to build an expanding nation. In the early 1890s, about a third of Washington's population worked in logging camps, sawmills, shingle mills, and in factories making lumber, wooden doors, and window sashes. Nearly 1.2 billion board feet of lumber and almost 1.9 billion shingles were shipped from the state in 1892. Huge trees still filled the coastal forests, and no one thought the supply would ever run out. At the time, there were no Forest Practices Act compliance regulations to follow, as the logs were dragged down rivers, and natural reforestation sprouted all recruits. Forest succession initiated across this region, and the status was only partially disrupted by this time. Gray wolves are native to Washington and part of our state's wildlife heritage. 
They were eliminated across the continental USA by the 1930s. By 2020, they are now returning to the state on their own. As a top predator, wolves naturally help keep wild elk, deer, and moose populations in balance with the available habitat and maintain herd health by preying primarily on weaker or older animals. Recovering this endangered species will help return an important missing element of Washington's complex of carnivores and their prey, which provides multiple benefits to a myriad of other species in an ecosystem. But again, this is only one part of the ecosystem imbalance experiences within the Olympic Mountains. When we flew in here a few minutes ago, it was to the crest of Mount Anderson. Sliding back in time to 1927, we see the Anderson Glacier. As years progressed, photographic imagery shows how the glacier has receded each year. No matter what you place the causes of global climate change on, the net effect is a warming climate where this glacial cap diminishes. For the blueback and all salmon species, this means the cool water drip with subsurface flows is vanishing. The rivering habitat is changing. We have witnessed the heavy timber harvest across the Olympic Peninsula, expatriation of the gray wolves, the warming of climate that melts glaciers. Then something almost unexplainable happened. Mountain goats were first introduced to the Olympic Peninsula in the late 1920s, but they are not a native to the Olympic Peninsula. Mountain goats are native to the Cascades in Washington State. Olympic National Park was established in 1938, almost 20 years later, as a 3,700 square kilometer natural area to conserve the native biota. This is when these off-site visitors expanded their spread. Look where these goats live, top of the mountains, rocky slopes, where even the cougar does not spend time. Who are the natural predators? Remember, this is a national park now, where not even hunters are allowed, and the Native American hunters who could hunt them do not have interest in a tangy goat steak. Mountain goats in the Olympics have been associated with damage to alpine vegetation and soil erosion. An airlifting effort by the National Park Service started in September 2018, attempting to relocate the goats back to the Cascade Mountain region. The National Park Service hopes to relocate several hundred goats before starting a lethal removal option. Here we are back to the Quinault Indian Reservation, with Lake Quinault at the northeast apex. This region has witnessed extreme modifications from extensive timber harvests in riparian and adjacent zones, gray wolf expatriation, loss of northern spotted owl habitat, and now secondary impacts to salmon caused by these ecosystem disruptions. Roosevelt elk populations are thriving. With no natural predator, they live in the national park, where hunting is not allowed. Native American Indian tribes can hunt these elk, but harvests are concentrated on adjacent Indian reservation lands. There is an ample population of fat and happy elk in the Olympics. Since time immemorial, not even canoe and raft riders could traverse the Quinault River. Too much debris and brush. It was not a navigable river. But now? What has happened to the thick hardwood trees, those giant spruce, western red cedar, and Douglas fir? Seems elk have settled their focus on these riparian zone soft leaves to feast. River rocks were never a bedding area for elk herds in the past times. River noises block predator sounds approaching for a kill. With those trees gone, the stream channel anchors missing, glaciers melting, the river temperature has risen. It now gets direct sunlight, and the river water velocity is increased. If you are a salmon looking for a place to spawn, this is looking bad. Here we start the discussion to prognosticate for the continuing trophic cascade. Will river-dependent species fall? What about the beavers, eagles, nematodes, insects, deer, or spotted owls? How are these all connected through the food web and their energy transfers? The shape of the upper Quinault River has changed. Spring freshens have seen the channel reroute, eroding at bends to establish new channels. Some salmon eggs are laid, then left dry. The western red alder, 
birch, and cottonwood are mostly gone. Since the time of the gray wolf expatriation, the population of blueback salmon returns has decreased. The population by 2011 was at critically low levels. In 2011, the Quinault Indian Nation hired me and my firm to work with the tribe, five U.S. federal agencies, six Washington state departments, the counties of Jefferson and Grays Harbor, and the Nature Conservancy to create a National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, compliance document in the form of an environmental assessment. The EA addressed the restoration of salmon habitat of the Upper Quinault River located within the geologic floodplain of the Quinault River. The EA considered the preferred alternative of installing engineered log jams and restorative planting of conifer and hardwood trees to meet the goals of improving river processes and salmon habitat, specifically for blueback salmon. Normally a two-year procedure, we were asked to acquire federal agency acceptance within four months. The process initiated by identifying a desired future condition. This began looking for similar biomes with analogous restrictive environments. Define what we are trying to mimic. For this, I went north to the Tlingit and Haida Indian tribes of Alaska. This tribe had been one of my clients before I started working with the Quinault Indian Nation, and their ecosystems provided an excellent example of our goals. Taco River Conservancy was established as a result of the Wooshtin Wuditi Atlan Taku Land Use Plan and Taku River Tlingit First Nation Strategic Engagement Agreement. This conservancy encompasses the British Columbia portion of the Taku River main stem from Alaska border to the confluence of the Nakina and Inklan Rivers. The Taku River Tlingit First Nation has a deep and significant cultural attachment to the Taku River reflecting a long history of use, occupation, and spiritual connection. The Tlingit name, Taku Tiu, means heart of the Taku. Here, logging was less intense than it was in Washington state, and the gray wolf had not been expatriated. The river ecosystem was not at risk of losing its salmon runs. The structure of the riverine system became an example of the desired future condition for the upper Quinault River. The Central Council Tlingit and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska and the Quinault Indian Nation share a deep cultural connection to the land and river. The salmon are brothers and sisters of the tribes. The Quinault River faces negative outcomes from the trophic cascade happening with the removal of gray wolves, which has been accentuated by large tree removal along the river shores and climate warming melting the glaciers at its headwaters. Wolves removed, elk populations increase rapidly, rivers warm and spawning grounds are lost. Salmon numbers continuously drop. Is that the entire reach of this trophic cascade? You might wish it is. The black bear needed those salmon for their meat. So do the osprey, scavenger birds and raptors. With the river channel scouring the landscape, the puts for beaver dams were lost. And with that, so were the nutrients they generated where insects used these unique habitats. We keep that nutrient-rich river water trek to the ocean alive to watch what happened in the littoral zone. The sea star habitat found is lacking the nutrient-rich formula they once had. Keep looking for mollusks, limpets, and razor clams. They get their food served at the mouth of their rivers. Clam diggers talk about the smaller razor clam sizes how there are fewer now. Why is this happening? They ask. Some call it a problem of ocean acidification, rising sea levels, warming ocean waters. Very few are even considering this as another effect of the trophic cascade. This is probably not the only issue of the compromised razor clam habitat, but I think it is worth considering as one of the significant issues for this population. Take this trophy cascade further to look at the seals and orcas who find fewer salmon to eat. I understand their plight, because I catch fewer salmon now as well. You can think of this as another example of the food web. Of course, you remember the discussions about northern spotted owls and how their habitat has been reduced to move this bird to the threatened, endangered, and sensitive species list. Only now you can see this through a broader lens to understand it was not only caused by harvesting timber, 
but also by the removal of critical river ecosystem habitats, where regenerating trees could have attained that big tree status for nesting. The same challenge presents for the marbled merlet. As we try to recover their habitat, we are failing to tag that big tree status in these adaptive environments. These birds need those critical components to establish within the riparian zones. So then, how do we reverse the trophic cascade along the Quinault River? Of course, we just reintroduce the gray wolves, right? <laughs> not so fast. The wolves have not been reintroduced in Washington state. The populations from Canada have migrated to the USA. Again, we looked to metapopulations and the natural spread to islands of suitable habitat scattered across the state. By about 2016, packs were identified as crossing the Cascade Divide. By 2019, their pack sizes were growing and gave indication that appearance in the Olympic Mountains will probably be seen, most likely by about 2025. But for blueback salmon recovery, that may be too long to wait. They need faster assistance. Action was taken by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and in 2005, they published a guide to build engineered log jams along the upper Quinault River. The plan is to reintroduce the large woody debris in the river, create anchors in the riverbed to hold the channel into a braided structure where salmon can spawn, the eggs will remain in the wet zone through hatching and emergence. An engineering construct, placement of the log jams needed to happen by crossing private, state, and federally managed U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and National Park Lands. The Quinault Indian Reservation extends only through Lake Quinault's shore. Although the state and federal agencies and many private landowners were willing and eager to participate, they all needed federally approved NEPA compliance to allow this significant federal action. On July 18, 2011, the environmental assessment my team prepared was federally adopted and appeared in the Federal Register. Work began and continues still. Log jams are being placed. Is this enough to recover the blueback salmon? Left alone? Probably not. But it is a step forward to facilitate recovery from a series of fatal errors in land management. I enjoy playing chess. I started playing it with my children and now their children when they were each youngish, like two or three years old. It is a game of thinking, strategy, and enjoyment on a board game. In these games of chess, I tell my grandchildren they should never dismiss any of their players as inconsequential. Not a bishop, a rook, or a pawn. You may never know when you needed that player to save the entire game. In ecology, this same theme may serve our earthly ecosystems. None of the players are inconsequential. Don't treat them like they are. In the words of Joe de la Cruz, past president, Quinault Indian Nation, quote, what we do to the land, we do to ourselves, end quote. <laughs>